I was involved with the serial killer. We're going to be talking about Joel Rifkin. Whole city is talking about this monster, Joel Rifkin. How many people did Rifkin strangle? 18? He had the same name as one of the worst serial killers in the history of New York. But the New York State Police didn't want to hear it. What I walked into was an ambush. Police are investigating the death of yet another woman, Mary Catherine Williams. Kevin was Mary Catherine Williams' boyfriend, former boyfriend. Hey guys, and welcome back to the vlog. Boy, today am I super, super pissed off. Can you tell? Look at my eyes. I am livid. You ask why? Could such a calm guy like me be livid? And... Ugh, huh. You know, I've been involved in so many crimes as a confidential informant and as my prior life as a criminal. Many. And just when you guys think you heard the biggest crime that I've ever worked, uh-uh, no way. Now, I know Roy DeMeo was called a serial killer and he was linked to, to 200 people. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. But I was involved with the serial killer. And he was the most prolific serial killer in my hometown, New York City. He confessed to 17 murders and was linked to as many as 40. So as we at Kevin Moore, the FBI informant, struggle to go on to make this channel great, I got a YouTube channel called Mad Mad World. Look, right there. And the thing that makes me so insane is that there were many articles written about me and we're going to be talking about one of them, the New York Daily News in 1993, what they did. And um, also, Mary Catherine Williams was the girl that I was dated who was murdered. Um, uh, was in my book. It's very easy to Google. Now, this guy, Mad Mad World, did a pretty thorough job of reporting the New York State Police's narrative, which wasn't true. He left me out. I mean, we're going to look into all the newspapers, and I was on the Maury Povich show. We're really going to put that on. And the buried bodies. Police are investigating the death of yet another woman, Mary Catherine Williams. Kevin was Mary Catherine Williams' boyfriend, former boyfriend. You were an eyewitness, Kevin, as I understand it, uh, one time between uh, uh, Joel and Mary Catherine. Tell us about that. Yes, I was. It was uh, sometime in September of last year. Yeah, but not as a confidential informant, because I was still working undercover at that time. So let me tell you what happened. I had very good information that this serial killer by the name of Joel Rifkin, who today lays in a Clinton Correctional Facility up in Dannemora, New York, by the Canadian border. He's there, he'll never get out. And um, I had information that Joe Rifkin did not act alone. I had evidence that he did not act alone. But the New York State Police didn't want to hear it. They already had just pretty much like the John F. Kennedy murder. They were... The government was hell-bent on, it was only Lee Harvey Oswald, it was only one person that fired three shots, even though there was a magic bullet, they still stuck to that narrative, to this day. Well, the fact is, Joe Rifkin did not act alone, and I, I could prove it. But since the New York State Police was the one that arrested him, they became the quote unquote lead agency. Now I, I, I also worked with the Suffolk County DA's office through Jim Doherty. And of course I've had a long 
um, relationship with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. And one of my detectives in 1983 was still there. So this is what happened. I get asked to go to the barracks on Long Island to be interviewed. And what, what I walked into was an ambush. They didn't like my narrative, and they were hell-bent on trying to disprove my evidence and what I was saying, that there was a second person. And in my book, I only mentioned the person by initials. Well, today you're going to hear his name, Peter Bradley. Peter Bradley. So I go down there thinking I'm going to tell my story about Peter Bad Bradley and the possibility of some of these homicides may have been filmed. This guy, Peter Bradley, was a pimp. And he was a pimp that got girls for Joel Rifkin. So I show up with my dear friend Jim Doherty, who we spoke about in earlier vlogs. He was a former New York City detective. Now he's a detective investigator for the Suffolk County Prosecutor's Office. So he takes me to the barracks. And I go, okay, and all, as soon as I get in there, I see a group of detectives, so-called detectives, state, state police. And what does New York State Police, you know what they're good for? Writing out speeding tickets. You know what they're good at for? Filling out accident reports. You know what they're not good for? Homicide investigations, because they don't know what the hell they're doing instead of leaving it to the professionals of the New York City Police Department. Those detectives know how to get things done. Not these clowns up in Long Island coming into New York City, not, not having any contacts, CIs. They, unbelievable what they did. So anyway, I go in there, and they go, okay, go in that room. So I walk in a room. It's an interrogation room. It's got a two-way mirror and a polygraph. And I go, what's going on in there? And then the detective, one of their detectives, investigators, or whatever the hell they call them, comes in there. We're going to do a polygraph. But wait a second. What do you mean we're going to do a polygraph? When did I agree to come here and do a polygraph? Get me out of this room right now. And I get out. I get out of the room and they go, hey, uh, I didn't expect a reaction like that. Well, you don't just sit somebody in a room and tell them they're taking a polygraph without their permission or, or, or future no notice of what was going on. This is how insane they are. And then Jim Dory, who's like my fa father, was there. He started getting nervous then, then. So anyway, I tell them about my theory, and they don't want to hear it. They, they just don't want to hear it. They said they've investigated that. And one of the detectives told me, right to my face, when I started watering up about my girlfriend who was killed and her remains were found up in Yorktown, New uh, New York in Westchester County, and her skeleton remains were found. And do you know what the detective told me? Now, I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but Joel Rifkin preyed on the most vulnerable women there is, and that's drug addicted, and then they're selling their bodies for for their, their addiction, to feed their addiction. And he preyed on them and he killed them. So all of his victims were street girls, working girls. And I got, oh, I don't want to get ahead of me. So one of those bastards had the nerve to tell me to my face, after he knows that I lost a loved one to this animal, and he said, well, you know, Kevin, bad girls get what they deserve. It's coming from a New York State police officer. And I went, what did you say? He says, I'll say it again. Bad girls get what they deserve. They put themselves out there. So anything that happens to them, is they okay with you? Is that what I said? Is that what you're trying to tell me? And I got up and I walked out of that room. So I was there for nine hours until finally 
three or four of the detectives real. And then they, then they were asking me questions. Did I ever go out with that? Was I ever in Joe Rifkin's trucks? Was I ever here? Was I ever there? And anyway, so I wound up on the Maury Povich show. We're going to show you a clip. And the buried bodies. Police are investigating the death of yet another woman, Mary Catherine Williams. Kevin was Mary Catherine Williams' boyfriend, former boyfriend. You were an eyewitness, Kevin, as I understand it, uh, one time between uh, uh, Joel and Mary Catherine. Tell us about that. Yes, I was. It was uh, sometime in September of last year where Mary Catherine Williams had an apartment in a storefront area on 9th Street in Lower Manhattan where she would frequently have her, her Johns visit her there. And uh, one afternoon, I was in the apartment across the hallway from, from where Mary Catherine Williams was, and uh, I heard the sound of furniture breaking and a, uh, a blood-curdling scream coming from her, um, her apartment. So, this is what happened. I go on the show as just the girlfriend. I don't go to, on the show as a confidential informant, a paid confidential informant. Are you kidding me? I'm still working. And uh, they didn't like it. And then the Daily News did an article on me, which we're going to put up. You're going to read it. I'm still at the barracks. Me and Jim Doherty, we leave. I'm pissed off. I'm thinking these guys are looking to pin this on me that I went with him. Well, I, I don't know what they were thinking. And the fact is they didn't know. They were fishing. They, they, they were just a complete bunch of idiots. One guy was stupider than the next guy, and he was stupider than them. And I was just like, oh, are these cops? What? I was, thought I walked into the bizarro world. That's how out of touch these, these guys didn't know what they were doing. So, I contact my friend, Detective Tom Harkins of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, which I worked for for 20 years at that time. It was 92, so since 1975 to 1992. I had a working relationship with that office. Very powerful office. Uh, Robert Morgenthau was still the DA at that time. Very powerful guy. Had a lot of juice. So Jimmy and I called Tom, I said, listen, I, there's this other guy that's involved in here. Uh, let, let me work for you. Let me work through you. So Tom said, okay. And boy, he almost lost his job. So Tom says, okay. I meet with the DA in, in Manhattan. And they go, okay. I says, give me a wire. And let me go into the place where she lived. Where she, and it was 430, I think it was 439 uh, East. 9th Street. See it right there? I did a video. I just got back from New York and I went in and I shot the video. That's the building that everything was happening in. Drugs, orgies, I mean everything was going on in there. So I say, give me a wire, let me go in and find out about this guy Peter Gladley. So sure enough, the DA hooks me up with a Niagara it's called. I'm all taped up. I go in and I start asking questions about Peter Bradley, not knowing that the New York State Police never told New York City Police that they had a surveillance set up in front of the house and they saw me walk into the building. Now I'm wired. I'm, I'm wired. And I'm up there and I'm doing my stuff. I'm talking to people, trying to find out more about this guy, Peter Bradley. And bah, 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 knock at the door. Boom, 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 boom. So the owner of the apartment, I, I forget his name, but it's all in my book. This story is in my book. He answers the door, and I say police, and I tell him, hey, just close the door. Close the don't, don't talk. You don't have to talk to them. And they push the door open. They push the door open, then they push their way in, two of them. And they start getting tough with people. Now I'm going, oh, <laughs> I got everything on video, you idiots. And they start threatening and they start doing all things that I know are not only inappropriate, but are illegal. They didn't have a warrant. They pushed their way in that door after he told them he didn't want them in the house. He goes, I want you to leave. We'll, we'll leave when we get up what we need. And then they, they, they look at me and I go, hey, uh, you got a minute? I want to talk to you. Hey, what, what do you want? 
I said, I'd like to talk to you outside. And he goes, well, I said, I'd like to talk to you outside. And I walked out, the door, out into the hallway. And I said, what, the f what, what are you doing? Do you know who I am? They go, yeah, we know who you are. And I lift up my shirt. And I expose the wire. I said, what you did just did was illegal. I, I have everything on tape. Thank you. I, I hope you hit the friggin' wall with your... But anyway, where was I? So now, I got all this at le illegal activity on tape. So what does one of the stupid... What does one of the stupid detectives say? You know what he said? What's that, for the media? I says, no. This is from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. You understand? I'm a registered confidential with them right now, and I'm working this fucking case. I'm working this case, and you just went into that fucking house without a warrant. Whoop! Then they, they were like, they both looked at each other going, could this possibly be true? And they take me, throw me in a car. Then they get on the cell phone, and they said, here, call the DA's office. I want to, I want to see you call the DA's office. And sure enough, I did. Yeah. Tommy, it's Kevin. These two state cops here, got, they want to talk to you. They want me to give them this tape. Here, talk to them. And they go, hey, this is a classic, classic case of the left not knowing what the right's doing. You know, we want that tape. I mean, we're, we're the lead agency. Then they start throwing their, their, their weight around. And um, so... I said, Tommy, do I have to give it to him? He says, no, get up and leave and get in the cab. Don't get in your car, get in the cab and come right down here. So I go down there and I, ha and I look at my friend Tommy Harkins' um, face and it's red and he's crapping in his pants. He's, he's in trouble, he's in trouble, I can tell. So I take off, we take off the wire and I said, are you okay? He says, I don't think so. I think they're gonna, I think they're gonna bring me up on charges for, I don't know, so anyway, so um, now what they did the next day, they went to the New York Daily News and they wrote this. See this here? They wrote that and in a public, on, in the media, they said that I was a paid confidential informant working for the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, and I was also working for the Manhattan too, but they didn't put that in there. And that um, I'm that that they did verify that I knew Mary Catherine Williams, but they think that I was trying to gain notoriety or or something because I was a paid confidential informant. The New York State Police told the Daily News, and they printed it, that I was a confidential informant working on a case right now. I was working. On, they threw away a five kilo deal. So I was going to sue the Daily News, and I was going to sue the New York State Police. But Tommy says, don't. I'm, I, I've been brought up on charges for not, I don't know what, what, what kind of charges he was brought up with, but then he later uh, retired. But he, he got in trouble on the going out, be, going, being retired. So I'll, to all you guys out there that are in law enforcement, when have you ever heard of a law enforcement agency going to the media and telling the media that this person is a confidential informant paid and working for whatever agency? When have you ever heard of that? We're going to get more into this, uh, this unbelievable story that has never been told before. And I was going to tell it, I mean, I, I, the, the, to all you viewers out there, there are just so many stories, I don't know which one to pick. But when I saw this website, Mad Mad World, and they're getting 280,000 views in a month, and I'm getting like maybe 800, what's wrong with this picture? That guy just did research on newspaper and court documents, and he told the story. He gets over a quarter of a million views in a month? Something's, something's not right with this. Anyway, we're going to come back and we're going to go get into the nitty gritty of what my investigation revealed and how it was ignored and how there's a serial killer to this day still walking the streets of New York City.